You know, worship will figure a little bit into what we're talking about today, and we'll come around to that in just a few moments. But we're jumping back in our, our series today. We've um, been talking about angels and demons for the last few weeks, and uh, angels and demons, as we mentioned, are a very popular subject in the culture. Lots of artwork, lots of concepts, lots of folklore, fantasy, lots of traditions, lots of ideas that are out there. But some of the information that we get, some of the ideas and the concepts that we get in our mind are, are more based on the culture than they are on what Scripture has to say. And so we want to make sure we take the time to clear up and separate the fact from the fiction and look at the truth of what God word, God's Word has to say. I hope you found it insightful and informative for the past few weeks. Um, today we move ahead a little bit, talking a little bit more about angels. I... Um, wrote in the teaser this week that went out in the e-news and, and online uh, about the idea of guardian angels. And I'm, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the idea of guardian angels, and I don't know what that image looks like to you. What does that make you think of? There's a, an image that I have for you to look at here this morning, and I, I put it on the bulletin this week as well, uh, that to me kind of depicts that idea of a guardian angel. I remember seeing this image years ago when our kids were little, and I, I remember just kind of how it touched me. You know, you pray for your kids, and you think about it, and you think about God's protection, and I was like, wow. You know, just that concept of angels watching over us. You know, uh, the forces of darkness, as we were talking about last week, are certainly not the only powers at work in the world today. And so we want to turn the table the other way today as we talk about the angels and, and their place in what's going on. But we may wonder sometimes out of the things that we've heard and the things we pick up from the culture, what is it that angels do? You know, you see images of angels playing harps and singing, but is that all they do? Do they sing and play harps? Are they God's messenger service? You know, the, the term angel means a messenger, and so we think about that oftentimes, about them bringing messages from God. Are they our personal guardians as we think about that idea of guardian angels? Over the past three weeks, we've laid a foundation of what Scripture says about these supernatural beings, and we refer to them very generically as angels and demons. There are other words and names that are used for them as well, uh, but we, we recognize them in that way. We've addressed the origin of evil and the fall of Satan. We've looked at the work of, of fallen angels, demons, and their purpose at work in the world today and spiritual warfare. And last week was very challenging in that regard. This week, we, we turn our attention to the host of heaven and how God employs them and how they may engage with us as angels on assignment. And where last week, I hope, was challenging to us in the way that we are aware of that spiritual battle and the way that maybe we engage, maybe we haven't, but we should, and how we can engage in that battle. This week, I really want to be a word of encouragement around you. Like I said, the dark powers aren't the only ones at work in the world. We need to be aware of, of both sides of this and find some balance in that. The reality is that we live in a world that is populated not only by humans, by natural beings as we recognize them, but also supernatural beings. We've seen that time and again in scripture and as we've walked through this. Angels serve or minister both in heaven and on earth. For the most part, beyond our observation. We don't see it. We don't see what they're doing. We don't see their activity. There are moments and times when we do, but for the most time, not. Angels do regularly interact with human beings. We see that throughout the pages of Scripture from both Old Testament to New Testament. And I hear stories and testimonies time and again of, of that interaction that takes place. Although we may have no idea even when that happens. You know, the closing exhortation in the book of Hebrews includes this statement in Hebrews 13 too. It says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And so we're reminded as they may take on a human form and likeness that we might not even realize who it is that we're dealing with or who we're engaged with. You know, there are many stories of angel encounters, and I know we can hear stories from anywhere. I've heard some from some reliable, credible sources in my own life. You know, how well we know somebody, I think, often makes the difference. Uh, like a friend of mine who uh, talked about his grandson who was in... Uh, one of the family vehicles one day as a pickup truck and they were out working on the farm or whatever little guy you know like five or six years old and he knocks the gear shift into neutral and the vehicle begins to roll and of course everybody's panic stricken you know here's this child in the car and away goes the vehicle down the hill 
and crashes into the tree or the fence or whatever. And so they all run down there and, and in great excitement and they find him and he's okay and he's fine. But the really cool thing was he gets out of the truck and he says, wait a minute, where's the light boy? And they're like, what light boy? And he said, the light boy that was with me in the truck. Just a remark from a child. And yet, you know, something amazing in that moment. Or maybe Arthur Owen Blessed, if you've heard of him before, he was a man who felt uh, burdened of God to make and carry a wooden cross through every country on the planet. There's a video out there you can watch about his story if you want to at some point. It's really quite amazing. But Arthur traveled through all these countries. He traveled through war zones. He went right through the Middle East and all the chaos that goes on there. He was in Central America, you know, with the drug cartels and the things going on down there. And in fact, that part of his story is where an interesting thing happens. He's camped out in this place overnight where he's been walking through and he's around between these different groups that are very militant and, and very hostile and he hears a commotion in the night while they're there, and he's not sure what's going on. And the people had told him, you know, no matter what happens, just stay inside. You know, don't, don't go outside at night or whatever. And, and he goes out the next day and finds out there's been this great ruckus out there. And they're like, yeah, these guys came with their guns, and they were going to come and get you, and they were going to kill you. And he said, well, what happened? He said, did somebody come and fight them off? And he said, no. They ran away saying they saw men dressed in white that were radiant that were all around the place where you were, and they didn't want to mess with them. And they left. You know, things that happen. Uh, even in my home state, back in Missouri, in 2011, there was an F5 tornado. That's like the highest class tornado that destroyed a town called Joplin. In the course of that, in the rebuilding, they painted a mural along the side of a building. And the mural is has butterflies worked into it but part of the idea of the butterflies was not just the renewal the metamorphosis that you know butterflies go through and things but there's also an angelic image in it because there were so many stories about the butterfly people from survivors who made the comment that there were these butterfly people and they described angelic type presences with them in moments of danger as the storm went through and things that happen. So lots of things out there. You probably heard stories of your own, maybe within your own family or people that you know. There are many others, you know, and, and books as well. Sometimes we just don't know. Remember Dave Reaver that was here with us, and he tells his story, and he's like when he was in the first hospital recovering from his phosphorus burns, you know, when the grenade blew up, and this orderly shows up at the hospital named Rosie, and he can't figure out anything else about his name. Nobody else knows. He's even run into another nurse that was there at the time, and she doesn't know who Rosie was or where he came from or where he went. She's like, well, when did he show up? About the time you did. When did he leave? About the time you did, and nobody knows. And he's like, was that an angel? Because it sure helped me get through what I needed to get through. Don't know. But anyway. But. While we talk about these things, you know, and there are books and stories and different things, there's a, a concern here as well, uh, just kind of like last week, about having an excessive or an unhealthy interest. Yeah, I think it's good that we know and to find encouragement in that. And like the story about the grandson of the young man, you know, I remember when I, at the time I heard that, it was great encouragement just about God being with us and the way that he provides for us. But there's still that opportunity for an excessive and an unhealthy interest. There's a, a great temptation for people to worship angels. And we see that often in Scripture when an angel appears and people are awestruck by that presence. They fall to the ground and they want to worship him. And the angel's kind of like, get up, you know, don't do that. This is not appropriate. You know, I'm, I'm a servant of God like you, you know. But there's that inclination there for that. And, or to at least focus on such experiences excessively. And that's definitely not my point today. Angels are not the main thing. They are created beings along with us. Uh, if you remember our recent study in Colossians before we stepped over into angels and demons, Paul gives us a caution in this regard as well. In Colossians 2, 18 and 19, he says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with the idle notions uh, by their, their own unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Now, our point is not to exalt and lift up angels. Our point is to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He's the one they're submitted to. 
He and the Father are the ones that are dispatching them to do what they do. They are the ones who created them. Angels are not the point. But as we're talking about these different beings and what they do in the world, here's where I want to go with this today. I want to share with you seven things that we can see in Scripture that angels do and that you can be encouraged by. So here we go. Angels, as I mentioned, function both in heaven and on earth. As we consider in the heavenly realm some of the roles that they take on. Number one thing I would share with you that points back to what I was just saying is that angels worship God. Angels worship God. They honor Him. They give praise and glory to Jesus. In fact, we read a couple of passages I want to share with you this morning. One we've talked about already in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. Isaiah is talking about a heavenly vision, and he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, in the year that there was a, a vacuum of a, a great leadership and presence, a godly man who was leading the country, Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I had a vision. I had a vision of heaven. And as he was drawn into this vision of heaven, he begins to describe the scene. And he talks about the one who, uh, filled, whose glory filled the temp- the train of his robe filled the temple and the glory that was surrounding him. And he begins to describe the scene and he says, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Now that's a little different than we picture angels too, right? You usually see, you know, the wings. There are wings apparently involved, at least with some of them at some times. But six wings, he says, but with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And so we see this description of constant worship, this antiphonal calling about the holiness of God and worship and reverence for him. Now, we find a a similar description in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 4, where John is writing about his experience of seeing the divine throne room and the divine presence, and he's even a little bit more graphic and more extensive, and you should go back and look at the passage, but I want to read you part of the, the, the verses of what he says there. As he's describing the scene, he talks about the one who is on the throne, and he says, in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, and in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, like in Isaiah. Uh, cherubim and seraphim, the guardians of the throne, and was covered with eyes all around and even under its wings. Seems strange to us. That's not something you usually see in the depictions, and yet this is what it describes. What it presents to us is the idea that there is nothing they don't see. You know, we we talk about somebody that sees everything. They have the eyes in the back of their head, right? These have eyes all over them. Nothing gets by them. They're the guardians of, of God's presence in that regard. And so they're covered with eyes. And then it says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, likely another class of angels, that divine council that we talked about previously, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created in heaven have their being. Revelation 5, if you're reading that and you turn the next page, gives a further description of what's going on. It begins to go into the the scroll and the seals and who's going to open the seals and is there someone worthy. And it tells in that passage as you come down, it does speak of these beings as having golden harps. I think that's where we get the idea of angels with harps and the singing and the praise because it says they had golden harps and they sing a new song. You are worthy. You are worthy. And so we get that, that picture in our mind, and we begin to see that. We're coming up on Christmas time, another image that you may have in your mind that we gather in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, with the announcement to the shepherds. There's an, uh, an angelic visitation who announces what they're going to see, and then it says, and then the sky was filled. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. 
Now, this is probably no surprise, but their worship may tell us something about how we perceive or how we fail to perceive the greatness and the goodness of God. As you think about that in that scene and you think, wow, all they're doing is, is they're around the throne and they're praising God. And, and in some ways we might think that sounds kind of boring. I dare say if we experience the fullness of the presence of God, like what's described in these passages, if we really understood the greatness and the awesomeness and the wonder of God, that presence that they're in constantly, would it evoke more praise from us? Because to be quite honest, sometimes it seems like something we've got to work up, something that's got to be pulled out of us, something that's got to be pushed on. Do we really have to be pushed to praise God? Maybe we haven't experienced his presence the way that we need to. He is holy. He is worthy. He is amazing and almighty and powerful and beautiful and radiant. And so I'm challenged by that. But we find it clear in scripture that angels worship God. Second thing in the heavenly realm, angels are warriors. Angels are warriors. They do battle. And that's why I think it's very misleading. We, we see such passive depictions of angels, you know, and they, they look very soft and very, you know, gentle and very easygoing. And yet, Scripture describes them as ones who do battle, ones who are strong, ones who are powerful. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 from the original battle uh, we talked about with the origin of evil and the fall of Satan, Revelation 12, 7. Then war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Combat, battle. And like we talked about last week, that wasn't just a one-time event. There's been an ongoing rebellion. There are ongoing conflicts that take place in the heavenlies. And we find that they are warriors. We've talked about the passage in Daniel chapter 10 where the angel comes to speak to Daniel and he says, you know, you started praying three weeks ago and I was dispatched to come to you. And he says, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, an archangel, the, the angel we're told in another place of, of Israel, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And so there was battle, there was conflict that was going on. Psalms 103, verses 20 and 21 says, Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Heavenly host speaks of a host like an army. That's the terminology that's used. The host that encamps against you. The, these are the armies of heaven. The, the word used there of the mighty ones, the Geboim, is the same as we talked about before with the mighty warriors. Those ones that are noted for battle and valor and courage and, and strength and great deeds and things that they do. And this is the description of them. They are warriors. And while we think about spiritual warfare, as you listened to that last week, if that seemed intimidating, if that seems frightening, it's not meant to frighten us. It is something we should be aware of, but we remember that God is greater. And God has already won. And God has defeated the enemy and has authority over the enemy. And we remember and we say, well, why does some of these things still go on? And we talked about the fact of the way that God's salvation is at work. And the fact that now is the opportunity for salvation. Peter writes that God's not slow in keeping his promise and doing all those things we think he should do. But that he's patient so that there's time for more to come to repentance. Because when he puts the enemy away and when it's done and when temptation is no more and there's no more opportunity to rebel against the Lord, there is no longer any opportunity to repent either. It's done. And so he's patient. His kindness and his grace, he's patient. But in the meantime, those battles and those conflicts go on. Number three, within those heavenly realms, angels are a part of God's governance. And some of this is reiterative of some of the things that we've talked about already. In Daniel chapter 4, verses 13 and 17, it talks about, this is when uh, Nebuchadnezzar is filled with pride and he's exalted himself and God says I'm going to humble you you know I made you a king I gave you your power I can take it away and this is when the judgment comes on him that he's going to go out and be in the fields like a wild animal for a time 
But the way that it's presented, uh, Daniel's saying, and he says, I saw in the visions in my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher. And remember that watcher, the holy one that comes down from heaven, a messenger of God, an angel in this uh, story that's related. And, this, and he declares the sentence against the king, and he says, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers. Again, that, that word that was used to describe them. And it describes their role in God's governance. They are watching, they're observing, they're monitoring the activities in the, the kingdoms of this world and the things that are going on. But he says, the sentence is by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And so God reminded Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king in the world at that time, there's someone greater. But he uses his angels in that governance and in carrying out that, that sentence and, and approaching that issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9, uh, Paul writing, he says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Now, Paul's using a little poetic license here in what he's describing to us to help us to understand. If you think about the culture in the day when an army went in and conquered another army or another culture or another civilization, they would go in and take the spoils, right? All the best of the land. And very often as they did battle, they would kill whoever they needed to in the battle, but if they could, they really wanted to capture the king, they wanted to capture the, the leaders within the culture, you know, the ranking royalty and officials and all of that, the important people, and then they would parade them back to their home country. You know, the Romans used to do this, the Greek cultures used to, the different cultures, they would do this, and they would take them in this parade of, look what we've done, look what we've accomplished, look at our victory in battle, and they came along as part of the spoils of the war, and they were condemned to die. They're not going to let them live, right? They just want everybody to see them and make sport of them before they put them to death. And so he evokes that imagery here uh, of you know, part of our experience and what we're going through, but he, he kind of likens it to that. He says he has exhibited us as apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death at the end of the parade. We've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. And what he's saying is we're seeing that uh, really in the flow of God's victory, but he talks about the powers that be that are witnessing this sign before angels and men because they represent the governance over the things of this world. Ephesians 3 and verse 10. Uh, picking up in there. It says so that through the church. The manifold wisdom of God. Might now be made known. To the rulers and authorities. In the heavenly places. Just a reminder again. As we were talking about. Those principalities and powers. Those structures that are in place. That we don't see. But we're told in scripture. That they're there. They're real. They're present. And so we find that angels are a part of that too. You know, as we talk about these territorial spirits and we've talked about the darkness in some places, again, it's not an out-of-balance thing. There are angelic powers in place as well. Again, Michael is referred to as one of the chiefs among the princes. He is the angel over Israel, and he fights for them and battles for them. And certainly God has others in that role as well. Number four, last one in the heavenly realms that we look at. Angels are agents of God's judgment. Angels are agents of God's judgment. We see this early on in the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? As God has begun to visit with Abraham and talk with him. And it says that as he's there, he has three visitors that come. And one of them is the angel of the Lord, which we'll talk about next week. But there are three that come to visit and he begins to relate to him what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities on the plain because of wickedness. We've come down to investigate it, to see for ourselves, and to take judgment. Well, you read the rest of the story, there's only two that go on. The third one does not make that trek, but the two angels go into the city of Sodom. And of course, you know the story that's there. Lot finds them in the square, and he says, oh, you need to come and stay in my house. And they're like, no, we'll just stay in the square. No, you must come to my house. And so he takes them to his house, and the men of the city gather at Lot's door, pounding on the door and saying, send out the men that came to you. We want to molest them, basically, have sex with them. And so the wickedness of Sodom is plain. It says the angels pull Lot back in and strike the men with blindness you know, in, in the moment. And so we find them in that, and they carry out judgment, right? 
not before evacuating Lot and his family out of the city, but then they're responsible for carrying out judgment on the city. Not the only place we see this. In many places we see reference to angels as they're used in acts of judgment. First Chronicles 21, 15, and 16. We did talk about this story before. This was when David sinned in counting the army and God, uh, he said, let me fall into the hands of God because he'll be merciful. And we find that God was taking uh, judgment out on them at the time, but we see this happen in 21 verses 15 and 16. God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it, but as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. Second Chronicles, I mentioned that it says, And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame, shame of face to his own land. And when he came into the house of his God, some of his own sons struck him down there with the sword. It was another one that had defied God. I'm, I'm greater than your God. I'll destroy you. And it says God sent an angel and wiped out his soldiers and officers. Not just stuff in the Old Testament. Some of you may look at that and say, yeah, that's all that strange stuff from the Old Testament. Let's pop over in the New Testament for a minute. Acts chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. This is talking about Herod. This is not the Herod that tried to kill Jesus. This is his grandson. And so we find Herod in this time in the book of Acts. He's the one that is now messing with the church. He has had uh, James, the brother of John, put to death. He's arrested Peter and plans to do the same to him. Uh, And he's very arrogant, as the Herods were, and very vicious and very cruel. And it says that on an appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and he died. Judgment. Judgment of God delivered at the hand of an angel. Even Jesus tells us about angels' involvement in these things. In Matthew 13, 49 and 50, he says, This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said that as he's sitting on the beach and they're watching men separating the good fish from the bad fish when, after they've been fishing. And he gives them that idea. This is how it will be. But he talks about the angels being a part of that. Many other places that they will be a part of that in time harvest of people. You know, those texts along with numerous passages in the book of Revelation portray God's use of angels and acts of judgment. I could have spent all morning just walking through Revelation and the different pictures that we get there as you read and he says angels that have bowls of the wrath of God and they pour them out in different ways and the things that they do in carrying out that judgment in that time. They are agents of God's judgment and justice. Let's turn our minds to a little bit more focus on what happens in that engagement with us in the earthly sphere. And uh, these last three things, I particularly want to encourage you. Number five, angels protect us. Angels protect us. Uh, Last week, in having that reality and that vision of what goes on around us in the battle and the presence of God in that and the things that are happening, we talked about the passage in 2 Kings 6, 15 through 17. And it's about the prophet Elisha, and that was when the king uh, was like, who's betraying me? Who's the traitor in my camp? They said, no, it's this prophet over in Israel, Elisha. He speaks the words you say in your bedroom. And he said, well, go get him. And so he sends an army, and they surround them. And so in the morning, it says in 2 Kings six fifteen to 17, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Nothing's going to happen to Elisha. I don't care how big the army is. As long as God is looking out for him because God's placed his army around them. You know, that those verses remind us of the presence of the armies of heaven in the middle of what may seem like an entirely mortal conflict. 
You know, we see the battle that's up against us. We see the opposition. We see what's facing us. And yet he says, no, there's something you can't see that's protecting you. Psalm 91, verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Daniel, chapter 6, verse 22, one of the stories we love to remember, right? Daniel in the lion's den. He's faithful to pray, and yet he's betrayed by the other uh, the other men of the king in the kingdom who are jealous of him, and they have him thrown into the lion's den, and he spends the night there. The king spends a very pensive night, grieved over what's happening and what's going on. He comes to the lion's den in the morning, and he calls out, Daniel, have you survived? Has your God saved you? And Daniel says, yes, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions, and they've not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Protected from physical harm. By angels. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10 says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. You know, it's from these verses, verses like these, that we take the idea of guardian angels. And I've heard discussion back and forth around that through the years. You know, people say, Well, do you have a guardian angel? You know, do you have this, that? Uh, truly, his angels are watching over us. Do you have guardian angels? Yeah. Is it just one? Is there one that's assigned to you? You know, do you know him? I don't know about any of that. That's beyond what Scripture tells us. But Scripture says his angels are watching out for us. And I love the idea as he talks about these little ones and their angels seeing the face of God. And you're like, well, if they're, they're the guardians, why are they seeing the face of God? Because they're right there where they can be dispatched at a moment's notice where they need to go. And uh, as far as one-to-one, I don't know. Some of us, I think, probably need more than one, right? Some of you all kind of accident-prone. You need a little extra help, the things that happen along the way. But... You know, some of those things. But God is watching out for us. You probably had some experiences in your life that you're like, I don't know how I didn't die, right? I don't know how it didn't happen. Well, maybe that was one of those moments. But yes, he's watching over us. Angels deliver messages from God. That one we grasp pretty readily, I think, because the word angel means messenger, and we recognize it and we know it. Again, looking to the Christmas story as we're going to be moving into Advent season very quickly, take a quick look through Luke 1 and 2 and you find Gabriel, you find angels coming with messages to say, hey, here's what God is doing. And it's a beautiful picture because there's been hundreds of years of silence and waiting and all of a sudden here's these angelic visitors coming to say, God is on the move, here's what's happening. And so they come to declare what's going to happen. In Matthew chapter 2, we, we find you know, them coming to warn them after the baby's been born, too. With the older here, and he's going to try to snuff the baby out of me. It says an angel comes to Joseph in a dream at night and says, get up, take, the, take your wife and the child and go. You know, go to a safe place, go to Egypt for the time. We find them delivering messages. We see it clearly in other passages of Scripture in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It was an angel that directed him to where he would meet the Ethiopian eunuch and declare the gospel to him and uh, have the opportunity to baptize him. But an angel was sent to tell Philip what he needed to do. Not just among the apostles and the deacons, in Acts chapter 10, we find the story of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. It says at Caesarea, in verses 1 through 3, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And one day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision and he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And then he begins to tell him what he needs to do. You need to send a Joppa for a man named Peter. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. Tell him to come and he'll tell you what you need to do. Angelic visitation that comes to him in response to his prayers as God sends him an answer. They do come as messengers. You know, again, we see that kind of stuff in Scripture, and yet we look over the pages of Scripture and the years and time that it covers, and you're like, well, I've never had a message from an angel. Well, I can't say that I have either, not one that I knew that's what it was anyway. Doesn't mean God doesn't still do it, you know. There's billions of people in the world today, and God's at work in different places. But the word's plain. This is what he does. And they come to us in times that we need instruction or insight from God. There's not a, there's not a chance that we're going to miss what God wants us to know. And I think there's times that we're afraid that somehow I'm just not connected. I'm not tuned in right. You know, I'm going to miss it. Can I assure you God's not going to let you miss what he wants you to know. He's going to get it to you. And I think he knows we're kind of 
a little hard-headed, a little thick sometimes. I think he does what we need, you know. He provides for us in amazing ways. His angels are watching over us. They're protecting us, and they're bringing us a, a, a word when we need it. They're bringing us that direction, that instruction. There are people that had times when, you know, they were in a situation where maybe the gas was on in their house, and they were getting sleepy and going, and something woke them up. And got them out of the house, you know. Somebody's in a situation where they need to go and they say, I don't know, it just, I need, you know, God's at work. God's at work to take care of us. Number seven, angels deliver and rescue people. And we've already mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah with the idea of judgment, but from which Lot was delivered by the angels before destruction came. They were very adamant. Lot, get your family, get out of the city now. They escort them out, out of here. And so we find them coming and rescuing and delivering. Daniel chapter 6 that we talk about when an angel comes and protects Daniel from the lions, keeps him safe overnight. Again, we find examples in the New Testament as we see this happening in Acts especially. Acts chapter 5 verses 18 to 20. Uh, Peter and John, the apostles, have been arrested for preaching Jesus. The Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they're jealous of them. They've got them locked up in jail. Uh, verses 18 to 20 says, They arrested the apostles, put them in the public jail, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out and spoke to them, Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Similar, later in Acts chapter 12, uh, situation with the younger Herod that we were talking about a moment ago. He's already put James to death and he's arrested Peter thinking he's going to do the same to him. Acts chapter 12 verses 5 through 10. Peter was kept in prison but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Beautiful picture that he's got enough peace to be asleep in that moment. Sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city and it opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they'd walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Divine jailbreaks. I like it. Anybody else get excited about that? That's pretty cool. That's fantastic. But I mean, again, it's the demonstration. There is nothing that can happen to us that God cannot take care of. There is no situation we can find ourselves in that God cannot deliver us from. There is no plan of somebody who hates us or is against us or wants to destroy us that can succeed if God is intent to protect us. God takes care of us. God uses his angels to take care of us, to be involved in our deliverance, to help us. Their assistance may also be in the form of strengthening. I was reminded again about the story of the prophet Elijah after he has the great victory on the mountain against the prophets of Baal, you know, and he calls down fire from heaven and God responds and gives him fire to burn up the sacrifice. Then he gets threatened by Jezebel that she's going to snuff him out. And all of a sudden he's depressed, he's scared, and he's running away. But as he's running away, we see God helping him and God sending angels to minister to him. In 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8, as he's been leaving and escaping he goes and it says then he lay down under a bush and he fell asleep he's exhausted all at once an angel touched him and said get up and eat and he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water and he ate and drank and then he lay down again and the angel of the lord came back a second time and touched him and said get up and eat for the journey is too much for you so he got up and he ate and he drank and strengthened by that food he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached mount harab the mountain of god an angel sent to minister to him and provide for him. Matthew chapter 4, we find Jesus after his baptism goes out and he's tempted to the devil in the wilderness. And he goes through the temptation and responds and he's resistant to the devil, answers to him with the word of God. And it says the devil leaves him. Matthew 4, 11 says, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Came for his strengthening, came for his encouragement, came to be there for him. Luke 22, verse 43, talking about Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, asking God, is there any other way? Not my will be yours, but is there any other way? And he's praying grievously in the Garden. 
And 22, Luke 22, verse 43, it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. They come to help us, to deliver us, to strengthen us, to encourage us. You know, Daniel 10 that we've talked about many times already through this series and because we find Daniel's communication, the angels that are sent to him. But in Daniel 10, uh, we see in verses 17 and 18 how Daniel felt weak in the presence of the angels. He says, I can't do this. And the angel strengthens him and encourages him. In one of the stories, you know, one other aspect of, of angels and their involvement with us this way, and one of the stories that Jesus told in the Gospels, the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it's an interesting story because it has no appearance of being a parable. You read all the parables that are told in scriptures, and it starts off with Jesus told a parable this. That story does not begin with any introduction to this parable. He says there was a man. And so I'm inclined to believe the story is exact, it's true, it's factual, it's historical, as he tells about the rich man and Lazarus. But he makes the statement about Lazarus, who's this poor beggar, and and, and the rich man who ignores him and has no compassion for him or consideration for him. But Jesus indicates that angels deliver the righteous to heaven when we die. Luke 16, 22 says, The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Beautiful picture that God sends his angels to come and get us. Perhaps that's some of those some of that warfare in the heavenlies, it's, a, it's an extrication, it's, a, it's an operation. You know, they come in, get you, and you're, you're, you're out, you're in, you're in the presence of God. That rescue that in that moment, but that presence in that. Now, let me finish with this idea. We have considered each week in this series, just tons of scripture, I know, and not the way we normally do things. But if we're going to see what it says about angels and demons, it's sparsely over a, a wide area and so here it is here's all the stuff and that's not even all of it I mean we we've hit some of it but we certainly haven't hit all of it but anyways we're talking about angels this week and just kind of giving you the overview of okay what are they doing what are what are they out there doing what what's going on are they all up strumming and singing no they're they're very busy at a variety of things but as we've considered each week in this series what's the point that's all well and good that's great what's the point here it is we need to be aware of the fact that there are supernatural beings and powers at work in this world. It's a level of reality that we need to have in the struggles that we face and in not being afraid and in, you know, the whole spectrum of those things that are going on. They are a part of God's creation and a part of working out his divine plan of salvation for us. And with regard to demons and spiritual warfare, as we talked about last week, we need to know that we're not alone in this fight. We're not alone in this fight. And as we consider the work of angels, we do not need to become distracted by or enthralled with them. So I'm not trying to paint a picture that we can be, you know, all ooh and ah about, about what it is. I think we can admire them. We can appreciate their obedience to God. We can appreciate the things that they do. Nothing wrong with that, but we don't need to be overly enthralled with them. Just comforted in knowing they are there and they are a help to us and they're meant to be a help to us i leave you with this last verse of scripture it's in hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 where he's talking about how jesus is greater than angels jesus is the revelation of god that we need jesus is our salvation he is everything but in hebrews 1 14 it says are not all angels ministering or serving spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation that's us God has them in place to help us. And I hope you find that very comforting. Because we should. God's got plans for us and he'll take care of us. We live in a world that's populated not only by humans, natural beings, but also the supernatural beings. And angels serve or minister both in heaven and on earth. And for the most part, it's beyond our observation as they interact and may interact with us along the way. We may have no idea. But are there guardian angels? Yes, there are. And God and his angels are watching over you. Be encouraged by that today. Everybody stand with me this morning. I want to pray with you and for you today as our worship team comes back. It's our response time in the service today. If you're here today and you have a need and you want someone to pray with you, 
Uh, we do that in obedience to God's instruction in the word where it says we should anoint you with oil and pray over you and we want to do that. If you're here with a specific need today during this next song, you can step out from where you are, come to the front at either side of the room and somebody will meet you there to pray for you. If you don't have a specific need that, that way, take just a few moments during this next song and just kind of close yourself in with God and just say, God, what do you want to speak to my heart today? Could be about this message, could be something totally different. We just want to be open to what God wants to speak to you. And make room for him. You know, do you practice taking time to listen? Uh, you know, we work on praying, but I don't know about you. When we, when we pray, a lot of times we do a lot of talking. You know, when you have a conversation with somebody, we don't like one-sided conversations, do we? When one person does all the talking, there's sometimes we need to say, God, do you have something you want to say on this? Just give him that opportunity today and, and be encouraged today. God's looking out for you in some amazing ways. Father, thank you again for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this place, to be family together, to be your kids. God, I'm never going to get tired of saying thank you for making me one of your kids. Thank you for loving me when I wasn't lovable, for coming after me when I wasn't coming after you, for persisting in that, for refusing to let me go. God, thank you for your awesome, amazing love and your amazing grace that can save us no matter what and through what and in whatever. There's nothing that can take us away from you. And that gives us great confidence. Thank you that angels are even a picture of that. Lord, if there's spiritual force that's needed in what's going on in our life, you can provide it. And you do. God, thank you. We love you today. May we be challenged in our hearts with that idea of worship, that if there's times we find it hard to worship, I know we're, we're physical human beings, we get tired. We get distracted, we get worried, we get burdened with other things. But God, may we have a glimpse of heaven. May we have a vision of you that inspires praise. Lord, may we join a chorus of angels in singing about your holiness and your worthiness and your wonder. And may, we, may it never grow old. May we never get tired. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. We love you today. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name.